Sick Harrison Price for Monday, April 8th, 2024. We're coming to you from the Nation Network studio built by Arbor Lee here at the iconic Wall Center, downtown Vancouver. And if you're heading out to a game this week or any event, make it a staycation. Call the wall 604-331-1000. Ask for the Sick Harrison Price rate. Some blackout dates may apply. Matt Sick Harris alongside Blake Price. Pretty sass hitting switches, conducting things. Big show coming up and it's brought to you. By Applewood Auto Group. Applewood Nissan in Richmond has the best-selling Nissan Rogue. The 2024s are in lease one at 2.99% for 24 months. It's all at the Richmond Auto Mall. Go take it for a test drive. You'll fall in love. It's all good at Applewood. Whole question today, what player holds the key to a Canucks turnaround? Thatcher Demko, Elias Lindholm, Elias Patterson. You can vote at Secure Some Price on Twitter and YouTube, this after the Canucks lose again to the Los Angeles Kings on Saturday night. They have not beaten a playoff team in a month. You have to go back to the Winnipeg game a month ago in March. 0-4-1 versus playoff teams since then. 0-5-1 if you count the Washington Capitals who have fallen out of playoff position in the Eastern Conference. My inclination was to vote Demko here. And, and then I looked at it and thought about it. Kings game, not very good. The Las Vegas game, not very good. But really, goal prevention hasn't not, been the issue, the issue here. No. Um, until recently, Casey DeSmith has played very well. More on that in a second. And so that brought me to Pedersen. Like, if he doesn't become a dominant player again, I'm not sure how long they're lasting in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They absolutely need two lines and a power play going, I think, to score enough goals or that's going to heap tons and tons of pressure on the goaltending and on the defending. So I voted for Petey. I, uh, I think it's a, I mean, all are safe bets. All, all these can contribute. And I, part of me wanted to heap some of the blame on Lindholm because it's just been such a vacuum of contribution for him. And yet well, defensively, and, and yet, you know, he's, uh, small chunk of the salary cap <laughs> you know i mean not that Patterson's making 12 million just yet mm-hmm. but we know that's where he's destined to be that's the expectation even though he may not be getting those paychecks yet that is now officially the expectation of him it, it has to be on Patterson. it has to be yeah i mean the case for lindholm would be if he starts scoring or driving some offense as well as being a fine defensive player penalty killer and yeah. all that yeah then maybe he gives you just enough offense to get you up over the top and to compensate for a, uh, well, let's face it, a bottom six that has had a lot of outages since the all-star break, at least Pedersen not being as good as he had been earlier in the season. Of course, this power play, which continues to show some struggles with a offer on Saturday night against the Kings. Let's get to our top story. She loves starts question mark. Mm-hmm. Wow. And it looks like Archer Shilov's last goalie off the ice, or first goalie off the ice at uh, walkthrough practice or morning skate at Rogers Arena could get the start in the biggest game of the season against the Vegas Golden Knights. DeSmith has lost four consecutive games, given up six goals apiece to the LA Kings and the Vegas Golden Knights. It's 17 goals in the last four starts, all losses, including the Dallas and LA losses of late March. And, you know, we wondered how much is too much for Casey DeSmith during that homestand where he had started all those games in a row. They finally worked Seeloffs in against the Anaheim Ducks. They won that game. They worked Seeloffs in again against the Arizona Coyotes. They win that game. And lo and behold, a guy with seven NHL games looks like he will be your starting goaltender against the Vegas Golden Knights as the Vancouver Canucks try and hold off the Edmonton Oilers for first place in the Pacific. The surprises don't end there, too. It sounds like Rick Tockett is uh, hinting at 11 and 7 again tonight, uh, with Juleson being the added guy in instead of Friedman like last time. So, um, we threw that out there as just an interesting tactical thought for the playoffs. Like, do you go 11 and seven Matt with them going 11 and seven again? Is this just because Lindholm's unavailable and he doesn't necessarily like the rest of the forwards that he's got available to him right now? Or are we seeing maybe the start of yeah. 
of Tockett's idea for the playoffs. Well, the fourth line skated as Nils Oman in the middle between Pius Suter and Sam Lafferty. So you would have to think the scratch comes from one of those three. Uh, one of those three, if in fact we're going to see 11 and 7 on uh, tonight. Um, Elias Lindholm, incidentally, back on the ice as an extra in the line rushes. He was also doing some penalty killing drills. Thatcher Demko not on the ice. Yeah. And Demko was on that trip. And look, not going to play tonight. That leaves four games. And we've all said, look, so long as he gets two, I, I think it's not going to be two sure of the last hope three. He gets two. Yeah. I, I don't think he's an option now for Wednesday if he's not even out there. And it's, it's a morning skate. It only is just an option just to, to get you know, the rest of his team shooting on him. It wouldn't be to get him in as a backup today or anything like that. No one's suggesting that, but I would have thought he'd be out there. So now I'm doubtful that he's at an option for Wednesday. And that definitely gets him in a full, full practice on Thursday or Friday. If not tomorrow, we'll see what they do with practice schedule tomorrow. But it, it's, at, it's at least once, maybe two actual practices for Demko that allows him to get in versus the LA Kings on Saturday. So or the Oilers, pardon me, on Saturday. So yeah. I, I think that's maybe the best case scenario now for Thatcher Demko. What do we think though of this, uh, of this decision to start Shilovs? I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I think it, I, a he played well. He has played well in the two games uh, this year, and it's an extra smelling salt to the team yep. of guys. It's your third stringer back there. Right. Eyes dotted, T's crossed. Play a responsible game, and of course, uh, against a team that knows what it's like to go deep. Down the goaltending. Yeah, they don't depth. care. Yeah, they're not feeling Down any the empathy. Down the goaltending <laughs> depth chart. Vegas has been in this spot having to win games with their third, fourth, even fifth organizational goalie as as recently as last season with all their injuries. Uh, Tomas Hurtle, we anticipate, going to make his Vegas Golden Knights debut after being acquired from the San Jose Sharks at the trade deadline. He was hurt at the time, but getting low on games here, and it's time to integrate the new guy from a Vegas Side of things. Let's look back on Saturday for the moment. The Vancouver Canucks lose 6 3 to the LA Kings. Uh, as mentioned, now a month between wins against playoff teams, and they're picking off victories against the teams that they they should beat, the non playoff field, which has allowed them to sustain this three point lead over the Edmonton Oilers. But of course, Edmonton with a game in hand and the big showdown looming, the head to head on Saturday from the Alberta Capitol. Teddy Bluger scores for the first time in 40 games since late December. Getting on the score sheet, we had wondered there had been some long droughts from some of these Vancouver Canucks forwards, and Bluger breaks his. That said, the Vancouver Canucks, who have been leaking oil on the penalty kill, continue that trend. Kings go two for four on the power play. Vancouver goes 0 for three, and we know the struggles there, power play has had and look higher event hockey than some other games against the Kings Blake. But once again, this LA Kings one, three, one system as posed the Vancouver Canucks trouble. Yeah. And, and yet I'm sort of forced against to, a team that could easily be your first round playoff opponent, but let's turn it around to determine whether or not that's an issue. Let's say the Canucks ran rough shot. Like well, we've already got this example. Canucks have run rough shot over the Oilers. So even if, even if the Oilers got the, the win on Saturday, three and one. Would you be confident going into that? Are you are you leaning on that because they beat them three times? They're going to then all of a sudden in the playoffs. Oh no, this is good for the no. I don't think you do. And in fact, I almost think sometimes the opposite can be true. If you surprisingly got the better of a team that you thought would be more competitive with you in the season series. It would seem to me the larger that sample size gets, the more likely it starts to even out. And you start to fret about, geez, what are the chances they take four of five versus this team? Five of six versus this team. So honestly, there was a time when I thought the LA Kings would be the best matchup for the Canucks in the first round because not necessarily scared by their offensive firepower. Didn't necessarily think they have a goaltender who could. No one player is going to beat you there. No one or player. Or steal series. No. Uh, not likely. 
Yeah, unlikely. I mean, over a seven game Kopitar squad. Kopitar and too. Dowdy are still magnificent players, but yes, yeah. um, you know, it, it's not like you sit there and go, oh, well, we just can't defend McDavid. Yeah. Or, oh, you know, we threw everything against him, but Saros or, you know, name your great goaltender, just yeah. barred the door. In one nothing. game, maybe. Yeah. But not over seven. Right. Over seven, I, you know. Um, now, Blake, honestly, I find myself into the camp of it doesn't really matter because the Vancouver Canucks are going to have to play their best or close to their best yeah. and haven't really seen much of that for a while now. So I, I'm very much now on the train of the Vancouver Canucks need to fix what ails them uh, irrespective of who the first round playoff opponent is going to be. Because no matter who you get, they are likely to be a tough out. You take a look at the what Vegas can throw at you, the way Nashville has played in the second half, LA in this one three one three one system that's caused them so many, so many issues. So, really, um, you know, uh, to me, I'm really less about first round opponent right now, and can they fix the power play, shore up the penalty killing, and get some guys going as well as getting Demko back healthy, and feeling some confidence in the final five games. This so season. let's bring it back to the Vegas Golden Knights here. Then, you know, we're asking of the Canucks, why can't they beat good teams? The Golden Knights got pushed to overtime late by the blues before eventually winning, get pushed overtime by the wild before eventually winning. And then last time out on Friday, allow six goals to oh the coyotes. God. Oh my God. Carrying a three goal lead into the third period, into the third mm -hmm. folks. And they allow six to the Coyotes and lose seven to four. So it like and I, prior to that, the Golden Knights were rolling like thunder. So it's mm -hmm. like, um, you know, you can, I, I think you can find reasons to be negative about your team. Oh, I, almost up and down the dial. Like the, the, the Oilers have had a couple of bad losses recently too. Like every team is flawed. Yeah, maybe not the Dallas Stars, but every team is. Is flawed. So you can find a reason to twist yourself in a knot. Absolutely. No, fair enough. But I think your, your previous statement is the most thing. Just you got to play your best hockey. And they, they'll be okay if they play their best hockey. And, and incidentally, um, uh, watch the uh, Iowa Connecticut women's semifinal NCAA game and then was all geeked to move over to the Oilers and Avalanche and the showdown between McDavid and McKinnon on Friday night. Don't even get me started. And realized, wait a second, it's not being distributed nationally, but Vegas and Arizona is. And at the time, Vegas was up big, yeah. so I didn't stick with the game. You know what? I, I broke down. Uh, I, I bought the online. I bought the online you, package. I so wanted to watch that game. Okay, I was like, fine, they win. They freaking win. Well, so I, I bought the online package, and it, yeah. it was a great game. I'm glad I did. Yeah, uh, I I struggle with that just because. Surely there are people with editorial responsibility and judgment there who are messaging to the group, guys, this is the bigger game with the bigger stakes. Like, let's make this one available, Sportsnet. And I guess the forces of, no, don't make it available. Force them to buy the package, won the day, and they won the day with you too. They did. So you, you went one and one in this booth, Rogers. <laughs> Gr <laughs> Grady, did you break down and buy the package Friday? No, no. Okay. So you went one and two Yeah, in this booth. Uh, anyways, scoreboard watching, as we've talked about, um, out of market game watching these days, a whole lot of fun with everything that's happening around the league and the races that are afoot. Uh, more on that a little bit later. If you happen to watch Pittsburgh, Tampa on Saturday morning and what a cracker that was. And, you know, you, you dial up the schedule any given night, including uh, here on Monday where penguins have a huge one now. Who'd have thought against the Leafs? Who'd have thought is right. Um, as other teams in the East around the playoff bar continue to leak a little bit, Pittsburgh can actually get themselves into a playoff spot with a victory tonight. Uh, albeit they'll have a, a game in hand on some of their mm -hmm. other pursuers, uh, namely Detroit and Washington. Okay, on Pedersen for a second here. I was pretty good, I thought, on Saturday night. Yeah, like if we're nitpicking Elias Pettersson and his performance in signing the big contract or since the all-star break, whatever sign points, sign post you want to put in there. Um, primary assist comes a whisker away from scoring on the breakaway. 
Talbot gets a, a lucky save there, I think. Oh, sure goal narrow goal. save anyway. Narrow save, yeah. yeah. Hey, goaltenders will tell you. None of them are narrow Not saves. Not the stick I, counts too, yeah. right? It's, I know where my net yeah, is. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I knew the knob of the stick was in the way there. Yeah. Uh, six shots that led the team. Scoring chances of plenty with him on the ice, both setting them up and, and being on the end of them. And um, this all while being matched with the Andre Kopitar line, which is a terrific defensive line. I mean, Kopitar, one of the fine defensive forwards in the history of the game. And Drew Doughty, who also, you know, at this stage of the game, Drew may not be the explosive, offensive-oriented defenseman, but damn, he can defend. So that's a difficult matchup, and I thought Patterson did pretty well. Their sides, their sides. I, I, uh, but these superstars are are supposed to win those battles sometimes, right? Yeah, they get the tough matchup. But you want the headline to be Kopitar doesn't have answer for Elias Pettersson. You want that to be the headline. Not he looked okay, but was ultimately fairly shut down by by the king. So, you know, the 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 fact that is that he's searching for his game. And you hope that these glimmers of light that we've seen in the last two lead to full on arrival. Hopefully for Canucks fans in this game. And if not, certainly by the end of the week when they have to take on the Edmonton Oilers. Vegas 8-0-2 oh, all time at Rogers Arena. Have not lost a game in regulation. Yeah. You'll be reminded that the one of the first stories about the Vegas Golden Knights that got out there, you know, after they had the terrific start in the expansion uh, season, was their ownership of the Vancouver Canucks. Mm -hmm. particularly here even in preseason in Vancouver no I believe that's right <laughs> if I'm not mistaken it started yeah. even in preseason yeah uh and of course lead the season series here uh JT Miller on a seven game point streak heading into this one three points away from 100 he's gonna get there right yeah did yeah. like the pause there. yeah uh, I yeah I think you will Tell me he's not going to get to 99 again. Oh, that would be oh, cruel so cool. by the hockey guys. He's got five games left. He can he can manage three points, I yeah. would think. Brock Besser on 39 goals. He's going to get to 40, right? Yeah. In yeah. Less of a pause. Even, even in an empty net, he's going to get to 40. Yeah. Coyotes Flames coming up on the schedule. There you go. Uh -huh. Philip Ronick, 48 points. He's going to get to 50, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's gotten colder. Yeah. I don't know. You know, less, Alan less Wash wants, well, mm -hmm. wants that big f number 50. Oh, what that 5-0 does for his ARB case or his negotiation and Alan Seven Walsh. times eight equals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So some still here in the Vancouver Canucks season. Look, folks, there was a time when we thought this is what we would be following down the stretch that these might be the bigger stories we were talking about the only stories yes down the stretch or yeah. even the only stories yeah. but edmonton on the come uh, record against playoff teams against the pacific division the likes of la the likes of vegas have become have thrust themselves front and center into the vancouver connects narrative down the stretch it's a big game for that matt like you beat vegas you force Edmonton to keep winning. Um, and, of course, not a lot of runway left. Not a lot of runway left. Like, that's the thing is that if there's 15 games left in the season, 20, mm -hmm. yeah, I think you'd be very nervous if you're the Vancouver Canucks because the Oilers are just coming so hard at, at the top of the division. But at the same time, you know that it's just there. It's right. You can reach out and touch the end of the schedule right now. Mm -hmm. I mean – Canucks need like a couple of wins. They like if one of those wins can be against the Edmonton Oilers, all them, all the uh, the better. But they they beat the Vegas Golden Knights tonight. Mm -hmm. You got Coyotes next, and then Edmonton. Well, I mean, this week they so, can tidy it all up. This week they don't have to wait till the final week. Here's the thing: if the Canucks were to lose this game in regulation, boy oh boy, then an Oilers victory in their game in hand, and then an Oilers victory in regulation. On Saturday, 
moves Edmonton into top spot. Mm -hmm. Now the Canucks have a game in hand and we'll have two games in hand after this evening because the Canucks play and the Oilers aren't back at it until Wednesday. But they play when, Friday as when, well. When they play Vegas, mm -hmm. the Canucks play Arizona, so it will still be two games in hand. Right. Then they play Arizona on the Friday, yep. which is the one game in hand, and then get their crack at Vancouver on Saturday. Yeah. And the Oilers home all this week. They do head out on the road to play their final two games at Mullet and then in Denver to finish the season on the 18th. If you're but the Canucks, the Oilers though, are home all this week of four, four games. If you're the Canucks, you're on two days of rest, albeit on the road. You're on two days of rest going into Edmonton, and the Oilers will be playing third and four. If you can't beat the Edmonton Oilers on the third and four for them and you on two days of rest, um, that's just a, uh, a comment on you. It really is. Like that is set up for about as much success on the road as you can ask for in today's National Hockey League. Short flight to Edmonton. You're rested. They're playing a ton of hockey. It's a big one on Sunday, too. But you know, it gets it gets a little less big for them if they win on Monday night versus the Vegas Golden Knights. Like they the Canucks can reduce the enormity of that game by getting these two here early in the week. And of course, the Coyotes won. You can expect it. It's not guaranteed, but you can reasonably expect it. The big one is this one. The Canucks have to go out and get this win. It's, I mean, I, I don't think we have to do the wink and a nudge anymore, Matt. It's a must win. Like, and I, and I mean that for the division, and I mean that for, for playoff momentum. Like, the Canucks can't be backing in like this anymore. There's, that switch is not so big and easy to flick that you expect the Canucks to be all world in game number one if they can't win any of these big games down the stretch. And they punted a bunch already. It's it's high time now. They get a good win over a good opponent. And we're yeah. saying that, Matt, about a team that's probably playing their number two in Logan Thompson. Still doesn't have Stone. Mm -hmm. Hurdle's going to be playing his first game in months. I mean... They still get a lot of breaks Aiden in this Hill game. Aiden Hill, too, has been fighting no something. For some, low, like, Aiden Hill's been fighting something for some time here uh, as well in the Vegas school. So, as I mentioned, when I was down in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, the locals were not very bullish on no. the team's chances to repeat. I'm sitting there going, look at this lineup they can dress when everybody's healthy. The local sense there's just something off about that team Yeah, this year. So much so, you can get in a building there for like 40, 50 bucks right now. Hmm. Yeah, a little bit of a Stanley Cup they, hangover. They're a little bit Atlanta bravey there in that, like... Yeah, all they've know, known is success. All they've known so, is winning, yeah. so they're like, tell us. And you're what. going to the playoffs again. So, yeah. Well, I mean, they haven't clinched or anything, but uh, they will be. Um, uh, speaking of playoffs, as we know, it's going on all across the greater hockey world. Uh, we told you last week about that Canuck Prospect versus Canuck Prospect series with Kudryatsev and Ulrichsen. Well... Ulrichsen, the loser on that side, and the Canucks have signed him to uh, an amateur tryout. He'll join the Abbotsford Canucks as they continue their playoff push in the Pacific Division of the AHL. Our friend Dave Hall from Canucks Army with the tweet, the Canucks have essentially created a training camp environment in Abbotsford, and I'm all for it. Soak in that pro environment and practice with the pros. And, of course, Love a it. lot of players there are just practicing because of the depth that they have, particularly on the blue line. So um, we'll see how Ulrichsen does big six foot six for uh, forward winger in his first taste of pro hockey in the American hockey league. Uh, the other thing I want to note here, well, there were some success stories in the province of British Columbia in the WHL playoffs. Alas, none of them here on the Georgia Strait. The Vancouver Giants season is over after they lose four games to one to the Everett Silver Tips in their first round WHL series. The Giants won the first game and then lost four straight and uh, weren't particularly close this past weekend, 4-1 uh, and 5-0 for Everett. And then there was the Victoria Royals who drew Portland and some close games there, but alas, no victories for the Royals. They're out as well. And so, second round of the WHL playoffs 
you have the Prince George Cougars, the Kelowna Rockets. That is your BC participation in what's left of the dub field. Yeah, hey, this wasn't supposed to be. No. You know, this wasn't their time in their junior cycle anyway, no. so you're not terribly disappointed. It is the Prince George time. Yes. So they are yeah. in their cycle, as we yeah. know. There has been very limited success for a lot of reasons up in Prince George with the junior team, but they swept Spokane. They finished first place. In fact, there's some lopsided scores if you look up and down the PG uh, schedule this year. So best of luck to the Cougars. That'd be great. And the see. Rockets yeah. in the second round, hoping for a hoping for a great competitive series there as well. All right, let's get to today's menu. It is brought to you by our friends at Greta and time for another game day hosted by Canucks Army and Sakarison Price at Greta YVR. Join the crew at our favorite game day watch party spot. This is Greta Bar YVR on April 18th to watch Vancouver take on Winnipeg. Doors at 4 p.m. Tickets are $10. Good food, good prizes. And a guaranteed good time. Get your tickets at nationgear.ca before they sell out. On today's show, we catch up with former Vancouver Canucks GM Brian Burke and a fantastic conversation with Brian, who, needless to say, is still very opinionated. He is also lending a hand to the Professional Women's Hockey League, which has had some terrific successes there. Anyways, if you know this market better than Brian in terms of surveying what's out there from a Canucks decision maker seat. So looking forward to this conversation with Brian podcast side. We'll get to some hashtags. Walter Cosman as the Vancouver Canadians begin their home schedule got swept this weekend in Spokane. They some pretty good pitching prospects on the, on the Rocky side of things with Spokane. They're back at it for the home opener Tuesday night against Hillsborough. At the Nat, big homestand all week, including a Friday, including a Friday nooner. Uh, big event that we need to remind you of with tickets on sale at nationgear.ca for Bro Do Your Playoffs. This is a media event celebrating the life and legacy of Jason Botchford. And of course, recognizing that it has been a long time since you've seen hockey playoffs in this city. So, Go get your tickets today. Uh, doors open at 1 on April the 20th. The festivities begin at 2 o'clock. Media panels from people of all denominations within mm. the media. Our friends, the matinee, are going to play a set as an intermission there. Good food, good beer. Yellow Dog will be around. And we're going to have a grand old time. So go get your tickets. Nationgear.ca. We'll see you at Hollywood Theater yeah. in Vancouver on April the 20th. Raise some money for the BC Mental Health foundation brian burke coming up next hey you no not not you you are you uh you an owner operator you have a fleet of trucks or cars well cal pro plus might be the dedicated tire program just for you free program includes exclusive deals and savings price match guarantee flexible financing and preferred pricing on everything you drive also you get a dedicated member support line that means that you can get questions answered also they'll source and recommend the right tire for you, your application, and your budget. Cal Tires Network of 260 plus stores are here to help so you can focus on the road ahead. Sign up for free at calproplus.com. Northlands Golf Course. Download the free app and book tee times with a touch of your thumb. And while you're on course, open the app for hole by hole GPS and track your score. Six to 90 day reservations. Jump the queue, lock in your date for $10 per player booking fee, limited daily availability. Check it all out. Golfnorthlands.com. Bro. 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 Bro, you ready to do these playoffs? Bro, do your playoffs. Come join us April 20th at the Hollywood Theater, West Broadway in Kitsilano. Doors at noon, a special playoff media event. We'll look forward to the playoffs. We'll have some media panels on stage. We're going to raise some money in the name of our late friend and colleague, Jason Botchford, for the BC Mental Health Foundation. Guests uh, from across all sporting aisles, uh, a special musical set from our good friends at the matinee. Great food, good brews. It'll be a lot of fun. Tickets are just $10. You can get them at nationgear.ca. Bro, do your playoffs. In a season like this, you never want to miss a single second 
of what's happening on the ice. And you want to be around your fellow fans, right? Well, Greta Bar YVR at 50 West Cordova, the perfect spot to do so. Hey, if you've got tickets, a great place to pre and post. They've got drink specials every single day. And if you don't have tickets, well, stick around and soak up the atmosphere with all your fellow fans, play all the great video games and air hockey, great air hockey set up as well at Greta Bar YVR. We'll see you there, 50 West Cordova. Joined now by former Vancouver Canucks general manager and executive Brian Burke, presentation of the Whistler Golf Club. Counting down to opening day on May 10th, club reminds organizers of groups of 12 or more. It's time to lock in those tee times for any time during the 2024 season as prime times are filling up fast. And just for reaching out the whole that time, you, the group organizer, you play for free. Whistler Golf Club, take care of the rest. Tell us about your group, whistlergolf.com slash groups. Brian, how are we doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me on, guys. You're more than welcome. Fantastic time of year to be a hockey fan. Uh, What races are you watching? And specifically, uh, what do you make of the Oilers trying to track down the Canucks here? Well, I'm in Utica. I'm here for the Women's World Championships. So you guys got to talk a little women's hockey first. uh, And we'll talk Canucks all you want. Um, (laughs) No, it's been exciting. It's been uh, obviously the coaching change. I really like the coach they let go. But obviously, Knobloch's done a great job. And they've made an amazing run. And they've caught the Canucks basically, or almost caught them, despite the fact they're having a great year as well. So it's been an exciting race in the West. What do you make of this Canucks season and the job that Rick Tockett has done on the bench? Well, I think he's done a great job. I think the goaltending has, has been terrific. Uh, both both goalies have played well. Uh, Thatcher Demko, I think, is a, a legitimate star. Uh, I think Casey's done a real good job filling in. Um, I think the big acquisition they don't talk about very much, Quinn Hughes is a superstar, no question, but the Ronick uh, acquisition to me is the key to this whole thing. He's made their whole team better and different, and Rick Tockett's done a great job coaching the group. There's not uh, a lot of manager can do at this point in the season with the trade deadline long past. I mean, they're, they're attending to college free agents and such, but with the Canucks scuffling a little bit here, what 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 levers, if any, like is there anything a manager can do, or does Patrick Alvin just have to sit on his hands and hope that the coach has got this to get this team where he wants it to be come game one of the playoffs? Yeah, I think all you do now is pray. Once you get past the <laughs> deadline, you just say the rosary as many times as you can. <laughs> um, no, I, I they, your job at once the deadline passes, your job is to be a cheerleader. You walk around the room, talk to the guys, pump them up, praise them. Uh, remind guys you need a boost to do something different. Uh, but you're basically a cheerleader after the deadline. It's nothing. It's the worst time to be a GM because the games are so critical and it's so tough to watch those games and see your team slip out of contention or move down, lose a spot, lose a standings place that will cost you in the playoffs because you're going to play a team you didn't want to play. It's very excruciating for the GM. Managers always say that you know whatever happens happens, uh, and co- coaches too. You know, in terms of those playoff matchups. But we heard Kevin Bieksa mentioned back in 2011. They were hoping for Tampa Bay in the in the finals. Deep down, usually there's a favorite, right? Oh, we we really want to face those, even if they don't necessarily say it publicly. <clears throat> yes, and they they don't <laughs> say it publicly because they don't want blackboard material. Sure. But the fact of the matter is privately they will have discussed this at great length and agreed that this is the team we'd really like to play if we could. Now, sometimes that bites you right in the ass. How much pre-scouting is already going on, Brian? Would you normally be uh, looking at your potential op- opponents and getting the pre-scouts ready at this stage? Yeah. It would have it free up people after the deadline, right? You're all your pro scouting people are unemployed after the deadline, really. So you can use them in pre-scouting. And that's what we always did. We always sent, uh, there are three or four possibilities you'd play in the first round. So you'd send a guy to track them and get their tendencies and get their line combinations, get their power plays, and then uh, and then focus as you keep advancing. The list gets shorter, obviously, but there's more teams that, that you have to watch that you didn't watch. And then you're really not pre-scouting the Eastern Conference until you get to the third round. Yeah. Hey, um, speaking of pre-scouting, the, we saw it again on Saturday. The LA Kings with this one three one defensive system uh, have given the Vancouver Canucks all sorts of headaches this year. Not to mention other opponents as well, and in some kind, some kind, sometimes even the fans uh, who don't love the passivity 
of it all. What do you make of that one three one? How difficult of a nut is it to to crack? Well, I I think any system can be beaten with 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 tactics and with good players. So I think to beat the one three one. The number, the thing for me is you gotta have to have speed through the neutral zone and get an outnumbered attack. So you're almost like a power play, where that that F one, if he's the center, you have two guys coming at speed. One guy can't cover two guys, so one short pass should beat two players, should spring guys out, and it works pretty well when the Canucks are playing their what their style and using their speed. You can crack that pretty easily in my mind. It's not new. One through no. one's not new. No, I'm it's, almost it's, surprised that it's back, Brent. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, – I, I think it's easy to beat if you have speed and you get outnumbered attacks, outnumbered people, just like a power play breakout to me. So I don't – I wouldn't worry much about that. The key is if whatever system you have, if you play with enthusiasm and, and vigor, you're going to have success. It's that simple. It's never changed. You know this market well, Brian. Um, you tried your darndest uh, in your times here with the, with the Canucks. Um, it, it feels like we forget what playoff hockey is about here in Vancouver. It's been a while since they hosted playoff games. Um, what do you think this market would look like with a semblance of playoff success? And I mean, that goes across Canada because all the Canadian teams have been starved for playoff success uh, of late. But this one in particular, you know, people in over 50 years now waiting for this. What, what do you think it would look like if it happened? And, you know, being a first place team, I think people's minds are wandering there. Well, for, first off, it's a great it's a great hockey town, and I had two tours of duty there, and I absolutely, absolutely loved both tours. And they're very different, as you know, Blake. You were there uh, when I worked for Pat. We came in, we were a non playoff team. We had a lot of empty seats. We ended up jamming the building and going to the finals a couple years after I left. Came back in '98, did the same thing again with a different cast of characters, different owners, but filled the building up again. Um, and people went nuts for that team. People still talk to me on the street about that team. If we'd only gotten a goaltender, we could have won. We could have done this, could have done that. It's a hockey crazy town, and they are starved for a winner. So I think that there's no fluke to this season. They've been in first place or second place all year. They're a legitimate contender. They've got the components to break down. You've got enough skill forwards. They've got enough grit, I think. Their D is much improved. Their goaltending is great when they're both healthy. Um, they're in a position to take a deep run here. Now what happens is, number one is, everyone, and I hate this because I'm going to do the, the broadcast speak, you know, the, the repeat the keys to the game that everyone knows. So, Captain <laughs> Obvious, thank you. But it's special teams, staying healthy, and it's um, execution at key times and goaltending. So it's going to come down to the same factors it has ever since they started awarding the Stanley Cup. And uh, I think they're in a good a good spot. I think they're in a good position to take a deep run. I like the coach immensely, and I like the players. I like their team. You mm-hmm. might you might have just worried Canucks fans mentioning yeah. special teams. Hey, <laughs> hey, hey Brian, great. like, w- would you think this is the thirstiest market for a Stanley Cup, given a big Canadian city and never having won? And did you ever allow yourself to dream like what that day, what the parade would look like in this city? I I never got that far. Um, I never. Uh, I, I felt we were close. I really, I still believe going back and this is talking to players too. I want to talk about the tax differential in a second, but don't let me forget that. Okay. But the fact of the matter is um, we never solved the goaltending problem. And Dan Cloutier, I think was a legitimate starter in the, in the league. He got hurt every year, right before the playoffs. And we were going into the playoffs with the guy who was coming off an injury three years in a row that happened. And they got they got Louie, and you see what happened, where he stayed healthy and played well, and they went to the finals. And the game should have should have won a cup, in my opinion. Just had to hold serve in Game Seven. But um, I think that excitement and that level of of uh, intensity and and anticipation is is for sure. They're as hungry as anyone. Now they never won a cup there. They've been to the finals what three times now, or twice, three times. Three, yeah, three times. Three times and, two um, Game Sevens. Yeah, and um, no, they're that close. I think that people say, how come there hasn't been a Stanley Cup champion in Canada since 93? I think people have to realize that the handicap that the Canadian-based teams are at from a tax perspective, they are taxed so much more heavily than US, their U.S. counterparts, and it's, it's exacerbated in the states that have no state income tax. So a Florida, a Nevada, 
uh, those in Tennessee, I believe. Texas, those, yeah. yeah, Texas. Those, those, they have a distinct advantage. They build it into their collective bargaining or their negotiation with players. Like they'll say, it, it, like Stephen Stamkos. I remember when they made the pitch to get him in Toronto, they offered a million and a half more, and Stamkos said no. His after-tax income, I believe. At eight and a half was the same as uh, at eleven or eight. It couldn't be that big. Uh, Ten. Sizable though, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so that that's the biggest factor. You get your no trade list from teams, and all all the Canadian teams are on the no trade list. If you get a a, a no fly zone for eight teams, seven of them are Canadian. So it's a real problem that we have to we have to figure out a way to deal with this. I think the cap should be after tax dollars. We've uh, we've been. Yeah, we've been talking about that this year, uh, Brian. Like once upon a time, and you were around, the NHL had sort of an equalization program for Canadian currency. Is there something that can be done on a league level for these uh, differing tax jurisdictions? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, like I, the answer is yes, but the problem is to change the system with, in negotiations and collective bargaining. You need to have a, a pretty strong case to uh, to do that, and you'd have to have the players agree or take a work stoppage. And I don't think anyone's ready for a work stoppage over that issue. So they'll just have to do the best they can for now and see what happens. We want to talk to you about your PWHL exploits and the world in a second here. Last one for me on the NHL though. And you uh, have had a lot of business dealings with Sid and probably have a little insight into his mind and maybe, you know, just what his inclinations would be. I mean, is there any way, any possibility he wears a different crest before he retires. I I can't see it, frankly. Nope. I can't speak for Sid. I had Sid for two and a half years. It was a real pleasure. Uh, it was funny. I was doing an interview about two months ago. Someone asked me who my favorite player was that I ever had, and I said Tamu. <laughs> and Odie, my girlfriend, said to me right away after the interview, "What about Sid?" And I'm like, "Yeah, how, how did I forget Sid? Sid, <laughs> Sid would be the answer." As far as being a quality player and a quality person, it would be Sid. And Tamu a close second. Tamu was a joy as a player. So he's such a good player, such a good person, such a good teammate. And Sid's all of those things. So I can't see him going elsewhere. I really cannot. But uh, I don't. I can't speak for Sid. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I know one thing. I never saw him as disappointed, as devastated as after they traded Jay Kinsel. Uh, I can attest to the Burke Solani relationship. I remember covering the uh, Western Conference Finals in 06. And as Timu was walking up to the dais to do his press conference, the World Championships were going on. And his general manager was trash talking him about Finland's performance <laughs> at the Worlds, especially against the U.S. It was great fun to watch those two go at it. Hey, uh, Brian, what about LTIR? load up where are you as a manager watching these teams in some cases now 20 million beyond the cap because the LTI are cushion we've seen it in Tampa we're seeing it this year in Vegas is this something else that deserves or needs to be looked at by way of yes. remedy yes it, ha- it has to be addressed it, it, it's not it was not it's not being used as it was intended when they collectively bargain this and it's being abused in my view so I think yeah it has to be looked at again you understand the players to fight this players would have to go so far as to accept the work stoppage. I don't think they'll do that for LTIR. I don't think the league was willing to do that. So the answer is, yeah, we got to work on it. Uh, much like the thing I just talked about the tax differential. I can't see that suspending players, holding a play or stopping play for, for any issue of that magnitude, even though as important as they are, I can't see us shutting down to get those things. Uh, I got one more, Blake, and uh, well, beyond what you want to talk to him about with the uh, with the PWHL uh, and the response that we have seen, uh, Brian, the sold out games in Toronto and in Montreal. Uh, tell us about your involvement and how do you think it's going here as uh, it, the season pauses for the Worlds before getting back for the stretch run? Well, I came in. I I was signed up late to this. I didn't help negotiate this deal. I can't take any credit for it, nor have I attempted to, nor will I. But it's been phenomenal. The response has been unbelievable. And the response in market where we have teams has been great. But the response all across Canada and the U.S. has been wonderful, including a couple of neutral site games. So we played a neutral site game. We have one coming up next weekend in Montreal. Sold out in two hours, 21,000 seats. 
Scotiabank Arena sold out, 19,000 seats sold out in a couple hours. They had a crowd, they've had routinely had crowds of 8,000 in Minnesota. Um, and so it's been the response has been Pittsburgh, 8,000, Detroit, 13,000. So it's been phenomenal. And I think it's, you know, the, as far as a launch, it's been the most successful launch of any women's sports league in history, in my view. I, so I, I, again, taking no credit for it, it's been really exciting and gratifying. A hundred percent agree. I hope, and guys like you, I'm sure, and people like uh, you uh, will uh, add their two cents on this. I hope they don't expand too quickly. Uh, we know the talent pool, it should be bigger than it is. Uh, we've screwed up with that historically, um, but it's going to take some time. I hope they, they're not going to get too ambitious, are they, and, and, and get too big too fast? Well, I don't talk to ownership. I'm head of the union. I don't talk to ownership. They mm-hmm. don't. I've never talked to Mark Walter in my life. Mm-hmm. I've talked to Stan Caston, who from the Dodgers, who's running the business side of things. I've told him exactly that, but I hope they're not in a hurry. The 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 product is is fa- fantastic. It, it's exceptional, but it's still not economical. Like we're losing a lot of money. These owners are writing big checks right now, and the temptation would be you could wipe out all those losses with one expansion. But I've said that to them. I, I told Stan, I hope they don't go too fast here because I think the slow build is the right way to go. We have six teams. That guarantees there's superstars on all six teams. We go to 12 teams, there won't be superstars on all 12 teams. Now, we've got a great wave of young talent coming. You'll see some of these some of these women play tomorrow or tonight. In Canada and the U.S., there's a bunch of young NCAA stars that are going to be in our league in a year or two. So we've got a new wave coming, just like the NHL always seems to have that new wave coming. But uh, I hope they don't go too fast here. I'm I'm with you on that. Hey, uh, Brian, uh, Brian, because we've sat here and watched the league from Vancouver and said, boy, it'd uh, be great to have a team ourselves. But does sort of geographic concentration have to be a part of the league right now as it grows from an economic standpoint? Well, if you care about money, it does, yeah. yeah if you yeah. care about money, and I think these people care about money because they're writing big checks now. Those checks only increase in size if you add teams from far away yeah. without close. You have to have some geographic grouping. So my prediction would be some expansion that keeps makes geographic sense to start. So you add four teams. You could add Pittsburgh. You could add Buffalo, Detroit. You know, you could add teams in that in that neighborhood and mm-hmm. still keep a bus league for the most part. A couple flights a year, but right now the only place we have to fly is Minneapolis or St. Paul. So, um, and then down the road, when you get to say you add four teams that way or two teams that way, and then you make the big expansion, say six years down the road and go West and then you have to fly. But I think we're still a ways away from that. My, my vote's going to be. There's, yeah. there's no chance that these closer games at the worlds are already the dividends of the PWHL. Are they like, they, is, it, is that just coincidence? But it, it seems like the scores are com- more competitive than what we've seen. Is it, is it a half season of PWHL already adding to this? Do you think? I think so. I, I I've said this for years. You guys know, this is not a new complaint. I've said we play too many games in the NHL for years. Remember the first day I, I worked at the league in 1993 Gary Bettman called me and closed the door and he said, I want you to tell me one thing that would make this league dramatically better. You can sleep on it if you want, but one change, one change that would make a, a world of difference. I said, I don't need to sleep on it, Gary. We play too many games. And, I, and Gary said, well, we can't reduce the number of games at this point. I said, well, you, you asked me. We play too many games. I've said this for since I came into the league in 1993. I think we should play 70 games or 72, whatever that number works out, where your schedule works out. But I'm never going to win that battle. And if they go to expansion, it's going to get even worse, I think. The travel will get even worse. So I believe expansion is on the on the books. It's going to happen. I believe it's a tragic mistake. I believe it will be followed closely by increasing the number of playoff teams. Again, a tragic mistake in my view. But I think they're both going to happen. Uh, lastly, Brian, um, our friends, Travis Green, Thatcher Demko, others who have made their way th- up the Canucks ladder when the farm team was in Utica, tell us amazing things about the Adirondack Bank Center and the atmosphere there. I- enjoy the World Championships. Thanks for the time here. Thanks very much. Hey, everybody. If you're enjoying what you're seeing here, then follow along with Secure Some Price on YouTube. I promise more content coming. They call it, the kids call it subscribe.
on YouTube. Well, how about liking it? Do that as well. Smash it right now.